trust. Amen? Amen. You're going to trust him no matter what. Amen? Amen? Oh, my goodness. You guys must, y'all must have stayed up late last night. <laughs> must have. Children, you're dismissed to Children's Church. You know, it's really and truly one of my favorite parts of the service. When you look and see all of these young folks going back to learn more about Jesus, that's just something else, isn't it? Amen? Amen. I'm going to tell you what. Y'all are dead this morning. What's going on? Huh? Where's the amens and the hallelujahs, huh? Boy, howdy. We're going to have to, something's going to have to happen to get some folks woke up around here. Amen? Amen. Uh, okay, that's getting better. We're, get, we're almost awake. We're getting there. Maybe another cup of coffee or two, you reckon? Michelle and myself and, and Jared and Sherry were able to go down this weekend. We had a pastor's retreat. Uh, the stake uh, of the Church of God in Oklahoma, uh, the, the assembly, they, they uh, got a grant and allowed uh, us to be able to bring all the pastors together from all across the state to meet down at the uh, Chickasaw Retreat Center down by Davis, in between Davis and Sulphur down in that area, real pretty part of the state. And we just had a time of renewal and, and a time of being able to just enjoy each other and be around each other, talk with each other. And then we, uh, we also had a meeting and we ordained two more folks to be ministers in the Church of God. And uh, we have uh, four others uh, that are in the process at this particular time going through different steps to be able to make it to ordination. And so we're so thankful for that. One of the things that I heard that was pretty disturbing uh, when we were going through the ordination process uh, with, these, uh, with these folks is that uh, inside of the Church of God uh, Reformation movement, we're losing about four to five pastors a month now due to one thing or another. They are dropping out and they are leaving the ministry and uh, leaving the ministry for good. And so uh, if you understand anything about who we are and, and, and the number of churches that we have, that's not good. There's something happening and there's something going on. And uh, we need to be in prayer. Now, here's what I'm also saying, and here, now, this is one reason why I say this. God calls people. He calls people. And it has to be a calling, okay? You can't go into the ministry and think, well, I think that's something I'd like to do. I went to school with a young guy one time uh, at Mid-America, and this, this guy, uh, he, he really kind of shocked me. He, he, said, uh, he said, we were talking about going into the ministry and things like this, and he was kind of going in to be a minister of music. And he said, uh, we were talking about being called, and he said, well, I, I'm not called. I just want to be a music minister. And we kind of talked a little bit more, and we were kind of talking about what, why we, we felt like we were being called and things. He said, well, he said, I want to go be a music minister because I don't want to have to work in my life. <laughs> he needs to come see you, right? You know, uh, there are people that are called to the ministry but a lot of times for a lot of different reasons people feel like they can't or they're not worthy or that they shouldn't if you have a calling for the ministry and I'm talking about a true calling come talk to me come talk to me and we'll talk about what it was happening and what's going on because really and truly, we need, we need desperately pastors for our churches. This is not just inside the Church of God Reformation movement. This is across the board. It does not matter what shingle hangs out front. Again, I will tell you, on average, in the United States today, 1,500 pastors leave the ministry a month. 1,500. That's the average. So, brothers and sisters, we need to pray. We need to pray that God's calling would be heard. 
We need, to, we need to pray for those folks who would hear God's calling, and we need to pray that they would answer God's calling. Because let me, let me tell you something. If God calls you, he's calling you for a reason. It's not just something, and I'm telling you, it's something you just can't let go of. It's something that won't let go of you. If God is really and truly calling you into the ministry, it's not going to let you go. I don't care what. It, there's just, it's going to hang on. It's going to be there. So just something that I wanted us to kind of think about before we uh, get into the message this morning and to be praying about. And uh, moms and dads, I know a lot of times we have goals for our kids. We all want them to be all-star baseball players, superstar football players. We all want our daughters to be the greatest gymnastics or the greatest basketball player or the greatest volleyball player and the best cheerleader. I really don't know of a greater honor than when God would call one of your children into the ministry. It is an honor. It's an honor to serve. And uh, pray for your children. Pray for them to have the freedom that they need in order to be able to make those kinds of decisions that they can hear God's calling on their life. Amen? Amen. 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 We've been talking lately about Jesus and following Jesus. And when Jesus came to the disciples and when he went to the very first four disciples and he looked at them and he said, Follow me, I will make you fishers of men. And as, as we've been going along, we've been talking about a few different things. So if you've got your Bibles, I want you to open up to Matthew chapter 5, if you would, please. Matthew chapter 5. We'll start at verse 1. Or excuse me. No, we won't. We'll start at verse 5. No. <laughs> Forgive me. I'm sitting here looking at my notes, and I can't get it straight. We're going to start at verse 1. Maybe I slept, <laughs> didn't get enough sleep last night or something. I don't know. All right. Matthew chapter 5, verse 1. It says, Now when he saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. And blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. And blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. And blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Jesus has just really and truly getting started with his ministry. We know uh, and understand that for about a period of three years, Jesus had his ministry, and he's really kind of getting started. We have seen and we have understood that before calling the disciples, he had went about uh, telling the people, uh, repent because the kingdom of heaven is at hand or the kingdom of heaven is here or here is near. And so he kind of went about that. Then he calls the disciples. He begins to teach the disciples. And then we see here where there is a great following that has come in around him and a bunch of people are, are coming in after him. And he, what he does is he goes upon a mountainside. And on this mountainside, it, uh, from what I understand, it's a real neat place because uh, my father-in-law, Charles Perry, has been uh, to, over to Israel. And he has seen where they feel like where Jesus done the, uh, the uh, priest, the, uh, the Beatitudes here. And he said it really is a natural amphitheater. It, it, it just carries the sound. He said you could get up on top of the hill and talk and people could hear you clean around down at, down at the bottom of the hill. So there was a natural place. Uh, you can just almost imagine in the beginning of time when God created all things, he'd say, well, you're going to preach from here one day, so let's create this. And the people are gathered there. And he begins to teach them, and he begins to show them, and he begins to give us something that is a new way. 
Now, remember, we've heard these things before. Most all of us have heard at least some of these things before. But when Jesus was saying these things, and when he first said them, this was brand spanking new stuff. They hadn't heard anything like this before. When we think of what the Beatitudes are, commonly called the Beatitudes, really and truly what Jesus was doing is he was ushering in a new covenant for us. He's giving us a, a, a new covenant to follow. Up until this time, we've had the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments have been a guide. But what the Ten Commandments did for us, the Ten Commandments gave us sin and what sin is and made us very much aware of the sin in our life. Don't lie. Honor mom and dad. Don't covet. The Ten Commandments. Jesus comes and he, he begins to talk and he begins to tell us things and he gives us reasons for why we should be doing these things. When he looks and he says, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. He's telling us something and then he's giving us a result. See, the Ten Commandments didn't do anything for us except to shed light on the things that were wrong. But Jesus gave us something to follow and then told us, here's the reward for that. So really and truly, this really is bringing in a new covenant for us to see and for us to understand and something to live by. These things are said, what Jesus taught here, what he brought to us are things that every single Christian, every single follower of Christ should work at and have in their life. Really and truly, this isn't a smorgasbord. It's not, we don't get to run through and say here, well, I think I can, I think I can be poor in spirit, whatever that means. I don't know if I'm very merciful or not, though. So I don't think I'll do the merciful part, because that's just not me, right? I just can't find a whole lot of mercy for a whole lot of people. It doesn't work that way. He's calling us to a place to where we see all of these things and telling us that all of these things are to be a part of who we are supposed to be. So let's just look for a few minutes at this. In the Beatitudes, we can see at least four things that Jesus is bringing to us. First is, it's a code of ethics for all of us. It's something for every single one of us to not only read, but something for us to do. It is something to apply to our life. It is a code of ethics for all Christians. The second thing is, is that it contrasts worldly values against kingdom values. It contrasts what the world says versus what Jesus says, what God wants, what God teaches, what he's taught through his holy word, through what Jesus is teaching as he goes all throughout Galilee teaching and preaching. The third thing is, is that it contrasts superficial faith, religion, with real faith in Jesus Christ, relationship. Jesus was after relationship. He was not after another religion. As a matter of fact, we cannot read anything about Jesus that we don't go through and we don't see that he confronted the religious people of the time. He was constantly confronting the Pharisees and the Sadducees for the things that they believed, the things that they taught, and all of these things that they were doing. You see, they had a form of religion that did nothing for the inside of them. Everything was for the outside. It was all about appearance. It was all about the things that they would do, all the ceremonial stuff that they would do. But inside, they were still just as black and just as dark as they could possibly be because sin reigned. And Jesus comes and he looks and he sheds light on the fact that there is something different. When we're not talking about something that is superficial, we are talking about something that allows us to really and truly change who we are. The fourth thing is that Jesus Christ uh, had brought about the fulfillment of the Old Testament. In Jesus, we find the fulfillment of everything that the Old Testament was telling us about. That doesn't mean that, that that doesn't 
nullify the Old Testament. It doesn't mean that the Old Testament is not important. It doesn't mean that the Old Testament is to be done away with because now we have the New Testament. It is still just as relevant. There are still principles. There are still things that we learn from the Old Testament. They are valuable. As a matter of fact, when Jesus was confronted by Satan, where did he go? The Old Testament. He used scripture from the Old Testament to confront Satan. So it's not that the Old Testament is done away with, but yet what it is saying is that there is a fulfillment of the Old Testament that now has brought us into the place of a new covenant through the New Testament. That is what Jesus is teaching, what Jesus is preaching, and the fact that he goes and dies on a cross to cover our sin. That's the new covenant that Jesus brings about. So when Jesus begins to talk about it, he begins to teach, and he begins to preach what it is, uh, and we look at these things. Now, let's understand something. A lot of times we, we feel like it is the Beatitudes that was preached on the, on the Sermon of the Mount, it's called. But that's not the only thing that he taught. As a matter of fact, you've got to go all of the way through the 6th or 7th chapter before he finally finishes up with everything that he taught and preached about on the Sermon of the Mount. But here he gives a foundation he lays out the foundation of his teaching. He lays out the foundation of why he is here. He lays out the foundation of what it's going to take to follow him. And he, when he goes through these things, there are specific reasons as to why he's pointing out each and every one of these. This morning, let's just take uh, the next few minutes and let's go through what he speaks about here on the Beatitudes and see what we can do to allow it to speak to us, to teach us, and to help us understand who we're supposed to be in Christ. The very first thing that Jesus says is, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. When we look at poor in spirit, when we see that, a lot of times I think our English language doesn't always do the greatest job of translating what the Greek words mean, but to be poor in spirit, really and truly, the suggestion is, or what it is trying to point to, is for us to be a humble people. We are to practice humility. We are to be humble before one another. The world looks at us and says, no way, no how. You don't do that. That's not the way that you, that, that, that you do we, we, there's no way that you're supposed to be. As a matter of fact, we're supposed to be proud. We're supposed to be a proud people or a prideful people. That's what the world says. The world says, I can't do this or I won't do this. How many times have we gone to a job and... Uh, <clears throat> we might think a job's beneath us. I got a college degree. I don't clean the toilet bowl. It doesn't matter that it's filthy. It doesn't matter that it needs to be uh, that it needs to be cleaned. But the, what we what we under, you know we look at that and we say, well, that's got to be somebody else's job. It's got to be somebody lesser than me that comes along and cleans that because after all, that's not my job. None of us like to go to a dirty restroom, do we? If our restroom should get dirty here in the church, with all these folks needing to use the restroom, wouldn't we be glad if somebody cleaned the restroom so that it could be used? Pride sometimes tells us and looks at us and says, I, I don't do that. That's not my job. That's not what I'm supposed to do. <coughs> Whenever I get an opportunity to talk to new pastors, those going into the ministry like folks like we did over this weekend, if ever I get the opportunity to get the chance to tell them, I said, listen, you're going to be an administrator. That's going to be part of what you do. People are going to come to you and look to you for for answers and they're going to come to you with questions and what about this and what about that but guess what goes along with it head bathroom cleaner mow the yard 
uh, carry concrete out of the building by block by block if you have to, right? Just because I'm the preacher doesn't mean that that's not my job. I'm not supposed to do that. I'm, that's, that's beneath me, right? If I see it and it needs to be done, I'm the one that needs to do it, right? So all, what I'm saying is, is that a lot of times what happens is our pride can get in our way. Our pride can, can bring us to places. And the world says that we're supposed to be a proud people or a prideful people. James chapter 4, verse 7 and 8 says this, Submit yourselves then to God. Redi resist the devil and he will flee. Submit yourselves then to God. Listen, when we submit ourselves to someone or just to, to God, there's, there's no room for pride. When we have a boss and our boss asks us to do something, what we do is we submit ourselves to the fact that the boss said this is what needs to be done. Now, a lot of times we don't always agree with what the boss says, right? But if we want to keep our job, right, and as long as it's something that's causing us not to go do something that is degrading or against God or something like that. But, I mean, and we're talking about in the performance of our job. We submit and say, okay, I'll get that done. In the same ways, what we're doing is we're submitting ourselves to God. We're submitting ourselves to what he says and to follow what he says in his word that we might be able to do the things that we're supposed to do as Christians. We resist the devil, and when, when that word resist is that when we call out and tell the devil that he doesn't have any authority or anything, to, he, he can't be here. He has to flee. That's an emphatic statement. He can't hang around. When you bring Jesus Christ into the issue, Satan cannot stand it. He can't be there. He can't hang around. So what's what we need to do? We need to claim Jesus in all of the circumstances where he takes us to a place. And maybe we're being tempted in a way. Or maybe there's something that's happening to us. And we, we call him out. There's many, many times when I look around and I'll go, Satan, you don't have any authority here. None. In the name of Jesus Christ, you have to flee. And God's word says... That if we do that, he's got to go. He has no choice. So, what Jesus was saying is, to be poor in spirit means to be humble. That means to swallow our pride. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Mourning. None of us enjoy mourning, do we? Because usually when we mourn, it means something bad has happened. Something that we do not agree with, something has happened that, that we're not comfortable with, so it causes us to mourn. But again, when we go back and we see what, what is being meant and what is being said here, it really and truly means to, be, to have a sorrow over sin that is in our life and in the life of others. Not just our own life but that there is sin in the world, that there is sin in the life of others. And it is to, we are to, when we pray for them, it is, it, is, it is like an act of mourning because we are praying that they would recognize the sin in their life, that they would recognize that Jesus Christ would help them be rid of that sin and that they could come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of their life. It is to be that we would, we would get down and we would be serious about when we pray for someone. You remember, I guess last week was it, when I talked to us and asked us about what it means if Jesus Christ were to come right now? If he came right now, who would we be afraid would not be with us to be caught up in the air? You see, all of us probably know someone who needs to know for sure that they have Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of their life. 
And we need to know that we can be the one that is responsible to talk to them. And that means that when we pray for them, when we, when we are around them, it is not that we look at them and go, oh, 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 oh right? But it is that in our, in our heart and in our spirit, when we pray for them, we pray diligently. We're not talking about a superficial prayer like, pray for Kendall, go on. No, it means when I see Kendall, I may not be looking at him and going, Kendall, I'm praying for you, brother. I want you to get saved. I want you to know Jesus Christ. But when I look at Kendall, I say, hey, Kendall, how are you doing? And secretly I'm going, Lord, bless this man. Touch him in his life. If he doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, Lord, I pray that you, you would work in his life. That's what it means to be genuinely caught up, to be, to be, the genuine article is to look at someone and to know that they need Jesus Christ in their life and to pray for them. That's what it means for us to mourn. James chapter 4, starting at verse 8, says, Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and well. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. Well, that sounds kind of tough, doesn't it? But what he's talking of and what he's speaking of is that it is in my spirit that I am looking at this and that I am I'm lifting others up before God. Asking God to send the Holy Spirit to touch them in their life. Jesus said, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Meekness does not mean that we get ran all over or stomped on or trampled on. And many is the years that have gone by that we have read this and we have thought that we're supposed to just be kind of a, the doormat. People are just supposed to run over us and we're not supposed to you know, Jesus did say, turn the other cheek, right? But when he was speaking of that, he was, he was speaking of and he was talking about how we're supposed to, to be in our life. When he talks of being meek, he is not talking about being someone who is the doormat. He is speaking of someone who is a kind, gentle, and considerate person. To be genuinely kind and to be genuinely gentle, and to be genuinely considerate of others. In all circumstances. In all things. That's kind of tough sometimes, isn't it? Because don't we all know someone we think, they don't need a gentle hand, right? Right? They need somebody to take a whip after them and get them to go to work, right? Amen? I mean, don't we see that? I mean, isn't that what we do? I mean, we look at it and go, we look at some folks sometimes, and we go, well, they look healthy. They ought to be able to go to work, right? We don't know what the circumstances are of their life. We don't know what's going on in their life. We don't know everything about their life. And Jesus says what we're supposed to do is we're supposed to be a gentle, kind, compassionate person. Now, in gentleness and compassion and things, it means that when we get to know them, if there are ways that we can help, we're to help. We're not to judge them and try to put them down. So many times what somebody needs is somebody to stick a hand out and lift them up. So many times, that's what is needed for that to happen. And that's what Jesus is speaking of. To be that kind of person that would be a gentle person, a considerate person, a person that is compassionate of others. The worldview tells us that rather than be meek, what we're to do is we're to seek power. In other words, I am to seek everything that I possibly get. I'm going to get everything that I can possibly get, and it does not matter who I've got to trample on to get there. How many of you have all known power-hungry people inside your organization? They're going to the top, and it doesn't matter what they got to do to get there. They will lie, cheat, steal. They will talk bad about you. They'll try to put you in the worst kind of light. 
just so they can get promoted above you because they're going to the top. The world says, seek power. Jesus said, seek meekness. Matthew chapter 11, starting at verse 27, says, All things have been, com been, com have been committed to, to me by my Father. No one knows the, the Son except the Father. No one knows the Father except the Son. And those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And brothers and sisters, when we look at that and when we break that down, Jesus is looking at this and he's not saying that you are in this yoke by yourself. I am in this yoke with you. It is the picture that he is painting and the picture that is to be understood is that there is a double yoke and Jesus is right beside me, pulling with me, walking with me, going through the trials, the tribulations, the good times, the bad times, the sad times, anything that we face, he is with me every single step of the way. That's the picture that is being painted. So we're to be a meek people. That is, that we are to be kind, gentle, and considerate. Jesus said, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. To search for right, righteousness. That is, doing right according to God's standards. It's not just doing right. The world looks at us and says, the right, you know, to do something right, you do it this way and, and everything's hunky-dory. But God says, and what Jesus is talking about when he says this and what he implies and what he states is that it is that we are to go according to God's standards when it comes to righteousness. It is not just any kind of righteousness. It is God's righteousness. To follow what he says, to follow what he's telling us to do, to look at it in his way. The worldview says, if it feels good, do it, because that's righteous. I am old enough to remember the 60s. <laughs> and I'm old enough to remember when guys used to walk like this, you know? And when they used to walk around and go, peace, brother. Now, you just imagine me with hair down to here. And imagine me with 40-inch bell bottoms flopping and flipping across and sandals on my feet, headband. Hard to imagine, isn't it? <laughs> and they said, that's groovy. <laughs> that's righteous, man. That's righteous, dude. Right? We're, we're old enough. Many of us are old enough. Some of us, some of us don't even know what in the world. What's he talking about? <laughs> a young man's looking at me like, that man's gone crazy. He's something wrong with him. <laughs> Just do, do, look, look it up, YouTube it or something other. You'll see what the 60s was all about, okay? <laughs> the 60s brought in an era that told us sex, drugs, rock and roll. If it feels good, do it. If it feels good, do it. And everybody thought that was righteous. And Jesus looks and says what we need to do is we need to follow after God's righteousness. Philippians chapter 3, verse, uh, starting at verse 7 says, But whatever was to my profit I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain the resurrection from the dead. In other words, Paul's simply saying, I want to be like Jesus. I want to follow Jesus. 
I want all of my life, I want everything about me to look like and reflect Jesus. When people look at me, I want them to know that I'm a Jesus follower. I'm a Jesus freak. I want them to look and to see that, that I'm doing everything that I possibly can to follow what Jesus taught. Everything else is considered rubbish. Everything else amounts to nothing without Jesus in our life. Any of our accomplishments, any of the things that we do that amounts to nothing if it's without Christ. Because that's all you're going to have in the end. If Jesus Christ is not Lord and Savior of your life, all you're going to have is the sum total of what you, were, what you could accomplish in this world. You ever seen guys uh, who kind of get caught up and they're caught up in their... <laughs> guys like me in their 50s who remember the glory days in high school... I was a running back in high school. I scored so many touchdowns and had so many yards. And bless their heart, it's the only accomplishment that they've really got in life. They've got to go back to high school days to try to figure out, you know, that more, what my accomplishments were in life. When Jesus says, with me, you can accomplish all things. When you set your mind to things, when you, when you, when, when, when you answer what I'm calling you to, you will be able to accomplish what you have been called to do. So he's asking us and telling us that we, we need Jesus, and Jesus needs to be all of us, in all of us, he needs to be everything we do, in everything we do. And yes, we should not do anything in this life, in this world, that we wouldn't ask the question, what would Jesus do? Nothing. No job opportunity. Nothing is, when, when, we, go, when we go out for looking for spouses... When we find spouses, when, we, when those things come along, every single thing we need to look and we need to try to focus it through Jesus' eyes and say, would Jesus be pleased? Is this what Jesus wants? And you say, Brother Wendell, that is being a Jesus freak. Yes, it is being a Jesus freak. It is about following Jesus. It is about allowing him to have all of us, not just part of us that we might be able to do what he wants us to do, that we might be able to do what he has called every single one of us to do. Jesus said, Blessed is the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Mercy is to be compassionate and kind, to have compassion for people. We are to be compassionate towards people. Listen, every single person in the world is a sinner. They have sinned. Every single one. The Bible says, no, not one has ever come into this world that has not sinned. So guess what? Ain't none of us got anything up on anybody else. We don't have the right to look down on anybody else. We, I, I don't care what the sin is. Well, you can say, well, I used to do this, but I've never done that. The Bible tells us, and what the Old Testament does point out to, is if you were guilty of one, you were guilty of all. The punishment is the same for any sin and all sin. There is no different kinds of punishment for that. Now, I know there's a lot of people that says, well, there's different levels to hell. and da -da 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 -da. Hell's hell. And it's a place we don't want to go to. And there is no sin that is, is any greater than any other sin. 
But we need to understand that when we look at folks and we, we look at them, there is a reason why things are happening to them the way that they are. It could be they made some bad choices in their life, and we could look at them and say, well, they, don't, they need to quit making bad choices. They do need to make, quit, quit making bad choices, but they need to have the reason why to quit making bad choices. They need the answer to, to what is different than the choices that I've been made. If you always do what you've always done, you always get what you've always got. Right? Amen? They've got to, they've got to figure out we've got to do something different in order for the same thing to quit happening over and over and over again. So we need to understand that we can be merciful. Ephesians 5, 1 and 2 says, Be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children, and live a life of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Be imitators. That says we can no longer use the excuse, I'm not Jesus. Jesus can do it. But I can't because I'm not Jesus. Let me tell you something. When Jesus comes to live inside of you, he comes to live inside of you. Not just to live inside of you, but to live through you. And when he lives through you, he's telling us that we can be imitators of Jesus. To understand to the best of our ability how he tells us to live our life, that we may go outside of these walls and live our lives the way Jesus teaches us to live our lives. we got to quit hiding behind things. Well, I'm just human. Yeah, every single one of us know that. And every single one of us make mistakes. None of us are going to be absolutely perfect every single day, all of the time. But when we understand that we've got Jesus living there in us, and when we understand that he's going to guide and direct, and if we allow him to guide and direct us in our life, we can be imitators of Jesus. Again, we can go back to the question, what would Jesus do? To be merciful. He says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. You know what, you know what that really, it, it means to be innocent. It means to be clean. Brothers and sisters, do we understand? How is the only way in this world any of us can be clean and innocent? Come on, talk to me. Love? Blood. 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 The blood of Christ. For us to be clean and for us to be innocent is to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of our life. That is not just saying some words and just praying some prayer and saying, I'm, phew, I'm glad I got that over with. We talked about that before. It is about a life change. It is about that Jesus comes in and takes us over completely. It is that he is in my heart. He is in my life. He is in my attitude. He's in my mind. He is everything that I am. So we are to be pure in heart. We're to be innocent. That is to that we look at and we understand what Jesus Christ accomplished on the cross for us. We need to understand the power that we have available to us to be able to live the kind of life that Jesus wants us to live. I get really tired sometimes of people saying things like, well, I, I am just human. I'm just a person. Listen to me. At the risk of, of, of maybe making some folks mad, I, I, I talk to people sometimes that looks at me and says, well, you're going to sin every day whether you want to or not. You know what? <clears throat> For some people, that might be true. Let me tell you, if that's our attitude and that's what we carry into the day with us, guess what's going to happen? You want to know what we should pray before the day starts? We need to be like that guy that prayed the prayer and said, Lord, today's been a good day so far. I hadn't got mad at anybody. Nobody's mad at me. I hadn't cussed nobody. Nobody's cussed me. I've, everything's going hunky-dory so far. Everything is A-OK. -okay. But I'm about to get out of bed. <laughs> or 
Our prayer should be, Lord, help me today that I will be everything that you would have me to be today. Help me to live today the way that you would have me to live my life. Help me to be the influence that you would have me to be today. If my attitude as I wake up and go through the life, if I look at my life, even as a Christian, when I go through my life and I look at it and say, well, you know what, I'm just going to, I guess I'll sin today sometime, so there I go. No, brothers and sisters, there is a power that lives inside of us. There is someone that is there to guide us. There is someone there to direct us. There is someone there that says, whoa, wait, stop, don't say it, don't do it, don't go there. And if we will listen, if we will listen, it will keep us, he will keep us from making some terrible mistakes. We're not perfect people. And I'm not sitting here telling all of us and things that we're going to be a perfect people. Again, I ask the question, since becoming a Christian... Is there anybody that would raise their hand and says, I have not sinned at least one time since I became a Christian? I see no hands. When we recognize and understand sin in our life, the Bible tells us that Jesus will deal with that sin and we need to listen to him and we need to fix that sin. And when he told the woman that was drug out in front of him... When he asked her, when they were ready to throw rocks at her because she was caught in adultery, and he looked down at her and he said, Woman, where are your accusers after everybody left? He, she looked at him around. She says, There are no, there's nobody left. Nobody's here. He says, Neither do I accuse you. Then what did he say? Go and what? Sin no more. In other words, don't go back there. Don't go back to the same thing. Learn from your mistakes. Learn from what you did. When Jesus Christ reveals something to us and asks us to change it, it needs to be changed because it's going to help us to serve him better. Again, if we go back to the place, if I always do what I've always done, I'll always get what I've always got. If I, go all, if I always go back to the same sin that was in my life and continue to do the same sin in my life, I'm going to always get the same results that that sin has brought to my life. Amen? And Jesus says, I've given you a Holy Spirit. I've given you a power. I've given you someone to live inside of you, to check you, to help you make decisions that we might be able to live our life the way he wants us to live our life. So the excuse that we have is, well, I'm covered by grace. Everything's fine. Yes, we're covered by grace. Thank God for grace. We wouldn't be here if it wasn't for grace. But that is not an excuse to go out into this world and go out into this life and call it that we can do anything we want to do because I'm covered by grace. That is not what that means. Nor has it ever meant that. But somehow or another, it's been hijacked. And people have taken that and they say it and they go out into the world and they use that, that, that as an excuse to cover their sin. Stop sinning. If Jesus calls it a sin, if the Bible calls it a sin, we need to stop sinning because it causes a gulf between us and God. It creates a, 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 a line there that we cannot cross. He wants us to live our lives holy and pleasing before him. And he's given us, he's given us what we need in order to be able to do those things. He's given us what we need to be pure in heart, to live our life the way that we should before him. 1 John 3, 1 through 3 says, How great is the love of the Father that the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. That's an exclamation point. The reason the world does not know us is that we did not know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and we will, uh, we will not be as we are... Uh, Excuse me. Now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. To purify ourselves 
is to check and to double check and to go back and to learn and to continue to learn that we might be able to, to live the kind of life that Jesus wants us to live. Jesus said, blessed is the peacemaker, for they will be called children of God. A peacemaker is someone who practices reconciliation in all situations. Not resolve, not to resolve things, because resolve things does not really and truly put anything away. Reconciliation causes all things to be put away. Reconciliation causes, calls us to a place to where we look and we say, we're going to stop what we've been doing and we're going to start new from here. The past is the past. What we have is before us. One of the best definitions I've ever heard of reconciliation is burying the tomahawk. You know what it means to bury the tomahawk? The old Indian expression is that there, you know, there will be no more between us. We bury the tomahawk between us. Don't leave the handle sticking out of the ground. When you bury the tomahawk, bury it deep so that you can't come back along and grab that handle and say, oh, but that, they did it again. Reconciliation means that we, in all situations, reconcile things. It causes us to realize we love each other. And even though whatever happened, whatever took place, brothers and sisters, did not God practice reconciliation over sin? We could not do anything in and of our own accord that, that God could forgive because that gulf was there, sin was there. Our best efforts, the Bible says, was like filthy rags. It took Jesus to cover that. That's reconciliation. And Jesus says that's what we need to do. To be a peacemaker, we need to reconcile. Romans 12, starting at verse 9, says, Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with God's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Again, oh, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Funny, there's not a lot of amens going up on that one right there, in there. Huh? I'm almost done. Y'all wake up. I'm almost done, okay? <laughs> rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everybody. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, It is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. And on the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Amen? Amen. Amen. And one of the things that Jesus told us here, in verse 11, he says, Blessed are you, when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You remember me telling you the story about the, the kid that comes to the college professor and he tells him, Professor, 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 I got some good news. The devil hadn't bothered me in two weeks. Hadn't bo I hadn't heard a word from the devil. Everything's going smooth and everything's going fine. I think, I, I think we, I, I'm on to something here. 
And the professor kind of hangs his head and he says, son, I feel sorry for you. And the guy, the student looks at him and says, I don't understand how in the world, I mean, isn't this great news? Isn't this great? And the professor looks at the young man and he says, no, you know what this means? It means you're no longer on the front line. It means you're no longer, he's not worried about you any longer. When folks look at us and when we are persecuted, Jesus says, consider it good. When people look at you and say, why do you believe that old book? Why do you follow a fairy tale called Jesus? Why do you, any of the things that they can throw at you, any of those types of things, when they look at you, Jesus says, rejoice. Because you know why? There's a reason why they're doing that. It's because light is being shined in the darkness. And remember what John said? The darkness did not like the light. The darkness does not like the light. That's why people look at us and call us nuts and crazy and Jesus freaks. Is because darkness is in control and when light is shined on it, the natural, in the natural, from the worldview, the way the world looks at it is to fire back, to shoot back, to say such things and call it a fairy tale or call you crazy. So, brothers and sisters, when we look at this and we look at the Beatitudes, when we're following Jesus and we've been called to follow Jesus, he is looking at us and, again, going back to telling us and helping us to understand this really and truly is kind of like a new, a new Ten Commandments for the New Testament. It is a foundation for each and every one of us to have in our life. And Jesus told us and taught us it is not just one or the other. It is all of it. All of it is to be a part of who we are. All of it is to be represented in our life. All of these things are to be worked on. None of us are perfect at all of these things. But what we can do is ask the Holy Spirit to help us us if we're not perfect or we're not work doing right in the in one area to ask him to work in our life and to help us in that area that we might be able to improve in that area everybody knows what a whiskey barrel is you do <laughs> no you know what a whiskey barrel is a whiskey barrel is put together with what staves there you go becky knew becky knows her becky knows her whiskey barrels <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're put together <laughs> they're put together with staves do we understand that to fill that barrel up it will only go as high as the lowest stave and may I remind us Jesus tells us to be completely full of him. So if there is a stave that is low, it is hard to be completely full of him. Amen? Amen. So we are to repair the staves, to make those staves even across, that we may be completely full of him. Amen.